I appreciate you guys uh, having me back. Thank you to the California Health De uh, Department of Public Health and Human Services, excuse me, Health and Human Services, and the California Healthcare Foundation, Stewards of Change, for the opportunity to come back and address you guys this year. Um, California has been really an exemplar of what's possible when data is opened and the community is engaged in meaningful interventions towards better health. Your data transparency activities have led a broader spectrum of innovation activities across the agency, similar to the design of the ones that we've piloted at the federal level at the HHS Idea Lab. In 2013, we started the HHS Idea Lab to encourage the spread of innovations that improve how the Department of Health and Human Services delivers on its mission. And through our work, we open the windows so that we can better understand our customers, the public, and they can better understand us inside the department. We encourage applying new thinking to the tough challenges, and we believe in experimenting, testing, and iterating. We also believe every individual has the ability to improve the health and well-being of Americans. People are more powerful when working together, and there is a solution to every problem. The lab exists as the bridge between the old world of a vision of uh, the old world and a vision of a new world, a data-driven world, a connected world, where value is found and an individual's talents and ideas as opposed to their position in a hierarchical structure. In government, supporting that kind of thinking so that it thrives requires significant culture change for those new ideals to embed themselves throughout the fabric of the organization. On this journey toward a more innovative data-driven department, we have learned that one of the most helpful, compelling aspects of the initiatives we spin out of the Idea Lab is their endorsement from our leadership, the secretary, the deputy secretary, and the agency heads. Broadly, it offers project teams the confidence and a green light to stay determined in their problem-solving efforts, despite the obstacles they will encounter along the way. In fact, their commitment toward innovation as an organizational priority has led the president to acknowledge, uh, to acknowledge the Idea Lab's work as a model for the cabinet-level agencies. So in that light, I'd like to acknowledge Under Secretary Mike Wilkening and uh, the internal and external supporters that are advancing California's data and innovation initiatives. It's been exciting for us in DC to watch California's Department of Health and Human Services invest in data initiatives and the evolution of the culture of the organization so that the default for your data is open and the approach to your projects is to try to find an efficient way to yes. Now I want to tell you about a few of the things that have happened uh, in Washington at the Department of Health and Human Services and what we've been working on. With the expert internal navigational skills of our Executive Director for Innovation, Greg Downing, we have continued to explore new frontiers based on two transformative experiences spearheaded by past HHS CTOs with a third initiative launched recently. Todd Park, the energetic bundle of explosive creativity is well known for launching what is now our health data initiative. The HDI's goal is to make health data openly available disseminate the data broadly across the health and human services ecosystem, and continually educate internal and external participants in that ecosystem about the value of the data. Brian Sivak, the red tape hacking entrepreneur, is known for breaking down the calcified processes with the formalization of the Idea Lab and its programs, which I'll go into later. Susanna Fox, our current CTO, is an enthusiastic innovator that prides herself on empathy for individuals and their families and caregivers. She recently launched Invent Health, empowering inventors inside and outside of government to create tools for better living and clinical care. Invent Health's quest is to explore how the department can adapt and upgrade to be more responsive to the fast-growing ec ecosystem of inventors focused on the hardware of health and human services. When we say inventors, <clears throat> pardon me, we mean anyone who designs, builds, or develops create, creative physical solutions with an eye toward improving the health of themselves and others. In addition, there are several Idea Lab innovation pathways that are expanding the impact of the initiatives I've already mentioned. HHS employs prizes and challenges competitions to spur innovation with public involvement for the development of creative solutions to vexing problems. Since 2011, HHS has launched 130 challenges with 8,000 participants, 
$6 million in, in awards with a median total prize purse of $50,000. In fiscal year 2016, we expect three times the amount of prize awards from 15. HHS Ignites is the department's internal innovation startup program that provides coaching and support to help HHS staff take their ideas from the conception to tested prototype. Over the last few months, the finalist teams have had the opportunity to explore their ideas a bit further through the direct interactions with their customers. Starting in April, the newly selected teams will begin attending a boot camp to kickstart their three-month journey. In some of her early days at HHS, Susanna attended the Ignite Demo Day and was very inspired and heartened by what HHS, HHS staff are doing across the department, empowering themselves to improve the way they work and serve the public. This year, HHS will award more than $400,000 in funding to pro five projects selected to HHS Ventures. Ventures is a highly competitive effort that provides growth stage funding and support to HHS employees with proven ideas on how to dramatically improve their office agency and the department's ability to carry out its mission. This year, the Ventures program is supposed is supported for, con con excuse me, supported for contr contributor contributor-specific projects from the Office of the Secretary and the Directors of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the National Institutes of Health and the National Cancer Institute, the Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, and the Acting Administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. These agency partners are also providing leadership support, mentorship, and potential applications for these projects. This year's tranche of applications showed collaboration across agencies more stakeholders and applications than ever before. We received a record 27 applications for ventures. Interestingly, but perhaps not surprisingly, many of our HHS Ignites and Ventures projects are also data-driven and data-producing. The HHS Buyers Club is a project focused on addressing the critical problem in government, modernizing federal acquisition of information technology and related services. Given the expansion and impactful, excuse me, given the expansion and impactful role of digital services throughout government, there are many opportunities to improve existing acquisition methods that support government services directly benefiting the public. Current federal acquisition approaches reflect unnecessary operational and cultural barriers to success, including, but not limited to, the lack of true end user stakeholder engagement from cradle to grave in a manner that maximizes value while op minimizing spend. We're not implementing new regulation for any new statutes, but rather emphasizing the strategies allowed under approved legislation. So I hope you'll see the notion in the Idea Lab is to promote an innovation pipeline that we are developing to support internal innovation from idea to implemented solution. But ultimately the goal is not to have an Idea Lab forever. We've often said that the mark of our success would actually be when there's no longer a need for an idea lab. Now, establishing an innovative data culture also requires, to a degree, a data-driven culture as well. USCTO DJ Patil says that data-driven government responsibly gathers, processes, leverages, and releases data in a timely fashion to enable transparency, create efficiencies, and provides security while fostering innovation. This administration has sought to enable better data management and transparency since day one. The desire was first signaled when on day one of the administration, the president signed the executive order to ensure open data and machine readable data in the new as the new default for government. And that has inspired a renewed drive toward better health, data curation and dissemination practices than ever before. I want to recap a few of the initiatives in government just to repaint the picture of what's transpiring of, of, in data policy and coordination perspectives. The open data policy requires federal agencies to collect or curate information in a way that supports downstream information processing and dissemination, like using machine readable and open data formats, employing data standards, and documenting extensible metadata for information creation and collection efforts. Another policy requires the, pub the government to allow public access to research results. The policy acknowledges that government funding for research is critical 
for the scientific ecosystem and requires federal agencies with research activities over $10 million thresholds to make the results of that government funded research freely available to the public. The public access plans include making peer reviewed publications stemming from HHS funded scientific research freely available as well as the underlying data supporting these publications. The Digital Accountability and Transparency Act or Data Act requires federal agencies to publish expenditures online and in standardized machine readable formats. This law will have the ability to tie spending to results viewable on usaspending.gov. Internally, HHS is working to make better use of its own administrative data. We produce a variety of administrative and programmatic data as a byproduct of program operations, and many of the resulting data sets are very useful for analytical and research statistical and other purposes beyond the originating program use. In instances where potential high value administrative data sets are not readily accessible for interagency access, we've begun assessing our administrative data system portfolio and developing recommendations and guidance for improving access to appropriate data sharing and high value administrative data at HHS. At the same time, all of this government data policy and activity was unfolding. The article we've all heard in Harvard Business Review came out stating that data science is the sexiest job in America, <laughs> which made me think being a chief data officer in the federal government must be a killer line to open with at a bar, right? <laughs> Increasingly, government agencies are appointing CDOs, recognizing the need to truly manage their data resources as assets. These folks are seeing to it that their agency is treating data as a service, looking at the value proposition for data because open data is not just a thing to do. Well-managed open data is now the way we do things. But to accomplish these goals of well-managed data, we have to invest in the personnel and infrastructure to support a more demanding capacity to participate in the growing data innovation ecosystem. To that end, all levels of government are seeking out data scientists that have an intense curiosity and passion for playing in the data, as well as the ability to manipulate data to solve the problems and tell a story. At HHS, what is now the Health Data Initiative was one of the first seismic culture changes that cracked open some of our calcified government processes, opening a new pathway for us to embrace and inspire innovation across HHS. By opening HHS data up to people who think differently about the data than we do, to folks who see those data through a different lens than the one for which it was originally collected and curated, we've begun to learn the true value of our data resources. The more we're able to bring unexpected partners into the mix, the better the ideas for the uses of the data. This approach acknowledges that government's role is to collect and verify the accuracy of data, not necessarily to provide the user interface for it. Our model at HHS has been to free the data and allow innovation to flourish, like here in California, nationwide and truly the world over. While our open data efforts are impactful at looking backward at what data we have produced that needs to be made open, we also have to be sure to make the budgetary commitments and IT investments that are, our, that are directed at a future of connected health and integrated social services resources. In her recent remarks at HIMSS, Secretary Burwell asked for interoperability of electronic health records. However, there's a comparable need for government health and social services systems to have technology that enable interoperability, private data users, and with, with, and one, with one another. I wish I could have worked in interoptimability into this, but I'm still practicing how to pronounce it. There are certainly pockets where HHS agencies are producing valuable tool sets for engagement with the data, who can see the variability in a population and can deliver the data truly in a useful and engaging format. Still, we have an obligation to analyze the systems we already have and those we're developing to be sure they embrace forward-leaning and well-supported technologies that will allow the most efficient data flow imaginable. Ultimately, what we're working toward is the construction of an ecosystem that fosters innovation, government as a platform, and more efficient government. In 2010, Tim O'Reilly and others asked questions like, how does government become an open platform that allows people inside and outside of government to innovate? 
How do you design a system in which all of the out outcomes aren't specified beforehand, but instead evolve through interactions between government and its citizens as a service provider enabling its user community? <clears throat> HHS is exploring the pathways to make Government 2.0 a reality. We've piloted demand-driven open data, changing the dynamic of dumping data sets onto our catalog sites and hoping they're useful, to one where we can be conversant with the public about what's valuable to them and attempting to deliver those data assets. That approach helps foster conversation, collaboration, supports government agencies in innovation with, not for the people we serve. Another, feder another interesting federal initiative is the recently announced Open Opportunity Project. Last Monday, the White House rolled out its public-private project designed to inject thousands of federal data sets into local anti-poverty activism accessed on the Census Bureau's website. The Opportunity Pro Project, for the first time, assembles a combination of federal and local data so that technologists, community groups, and local governments can help families find affordable housing, help business identify services they need, and help policymakers see inequities in their communities and make investments to expand fair housing and increase economic mobility. This is the power of data when it's creatively employ employed to foster open innovation and collaborative and collaboration to solve problems nationwide. And speaking of the power of data, its creative utilization, it's, and its creative utilization, it's nearly time for the Health Data Palooza. On May 8th, we'll gather in Washington, D.C. for the seventh Health Data Palooza, a gathering for people and organizations creating knowledge from data and pioneering innovations that drive health policy and practice and generate market value. The sessions will challenge our assumptions, help us generate new connections with others, and facilitate engagement across a diverse perspectives in, in topics. This year, the Health Data Palooza is pleased to announce and host a codeathon using non-governmental de-identified administrative claims data and electronic rec record clinical data with the goal of establishing algorithms to predict clinical response to rheumatoid arthritis. The Rheumatoid Arthritis Data Challenge is sponsored by Optum, Academy Health, and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Striking at the heart of a key issue in health outcomes research, Participants will be provided access to secured development environment in a staged comp competition over three weeks to create the best competitive algorithms to gauge clinical response in rheumatoid arthritis management. 15 teams will be competing for $40,000 in prizes with the winners announced at the Health Data Palooza on May 10th. Teams are encouraged to register before March 21st, so go online to healthdatapalooza.org. Learn more about this incre incredible data event the challenge, and much, much more. You know, back at HIMSS, I also heard John Halamka, a leading health IT expert, remark that this, it is now possible to connect the entire health ecosystem, including government, adding the fact that if you want to have a, comp a company that holds data instead of connecting to more data, you will be left behind because connecting the health system is happening with or without you. From my view, the same can be said for government innovation. Get on board, because it's happening with or without you. But the ideas, implementations, and outcomes are going to be so much better if it happens with you. You, the government innovator who has a great idea for how to do your job more efficiently and effectively at a lower cost. You, the philanthropy that is pressing on for innovative approaches to data-driven healthcare interventions for community and population-level outcomes. You, the entrepreneurs that need higher quality, more timely data to truly disrupt the status quo in healthcare, driving us to a high functioning, connected health and social services system. And you, the engaged citizen who sees the most direct way how data-driven policies affect your family, your loved ones, and our neighborhoods. So let's press on to help build game-changing products and services on top of our data. And let's create a government as the strongest platform possible for us to build the best yet unimaginable solutions to all of our vexing problems. Thank you all so much for your time today and all the best to all of you for a phenomenal Open Data Fest. Thank you.
can take questions if you'd like. Are there any questions? Right here to front. I'm curious. Hello? Hello? Okay. Hello. I'm curious about what efforts there are within all of these various initiatives uh, to reach out. You know, what, how much, to what extent are they federal, period, you know, to improve the performance of the federal government? Mm -hmm. And to what extent are there tentacles that come out to the states and to localities mm -hmm. uh, to, to drive their work? It's a really good question. You know, um, speaking from the open data perspective, and especially to my government colleagues in the room, there are a lot of things that you can be participatory in at the federal level. So, for example, uh, there was a call this morning for the open data biweekly call, which basically is a convening of government representatives who are focused on data and open data, data management, et cetera. Uh, to be part of this conversation, and it's not limited to feds. So there are state representatives that come on the call and uh, are often making presentations about things that they're doing. Um, it, and that's an, exem an example of sort of all of the different things that are allowing state governments to reach out and be participatory. I can't necessarily give you a wide breadth of examples, but speaking from my perch as an open data person, I know that, you know, data.gov, the, um, the uh, uh, CTO's office at the at the White House, et cetera, are all very interested in a much larger conversation so that we can understand what your needs are, figure out if it's anything that we've solved at a federal level, and help you to uh, prevent recreating the wheel. So there are a lot of opportunities, and the administrative data and other things are great examples of what we're trying to accomplish that hopefully we can be um, sort of bi-directionally conversant on. Are there others? Um, try to sort out my thoughts in my head, sorting with the thoughts through my head, making it more concise. Um, I'm a child abuse investigator, but my other life, I'm a hacker, and I go to hackathons, and I, that's what I do. I go mm -hmm. to hackathons, government related, Thank you. white hat, mm -hmm. everywhere, from Stanford all the way to San Diego, awesome. and across. Um, so whenever I see something like this, it gets me super excited. I'm like, oh my God, now I can hack. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Mission accomplished, thank you very much. <laughs> but the thing is, it's like, there's so much chaos in the hacker community where they, there's a lot of folks that wanna do civic engagement, hacking, and it's very difficult when you want to continue that work and trying to find folks and agents to continue the work. Mm -hmm. um, like for example, um, I did a hack for uh, Mark Lee Thomas. I did one for um, Mayor of Los Angeles and for Code for America. Um, I did a sex trafficking app for the mayor's office, mm -hmm. one first place. Did one for Code for America, one first place out of 546. Cons uh, can you put the mic up just a little so I can hear you a little better? Thanks. Well, the thing is, because of all the stuff that I'm doing, there's a whole cadre of folks that love to do this in the tech. Mm -hmm but they don't know where to go. Um, there's Code for America and there's other groups out there, mm -hmm. but they're not connected. I see. And so there's a lot of repetitive stuff. Mm -hmm. um, then you have, so I, I understand the industry really well because I've been in it for such a long time, 19, social services in 1995, so I get it. Um, but the tech industry is hungry for this stuff, but they, literally there's, they're lost. So what I think I hear you asking yeah. is how can we better connect the efforts that are sort of, well, disconnected, and better sort of communication so that you can understand what's transpiring even in your local community, let alone what's happening nationwide. Is that roughly? Right, like for example, um, I have some friends that do really good hacking applications, but it dies at the local level. Yes. And it has national implications. Mm -hmm. I see what they're doing, and it's incredible work, mm -hmm. but it dies. Yeah. So that's an interesting thing, you know, we, if I can make a, what I think is a little bit of a parallel, there's, um, so for me in the open data space, one of my challenges is constantly being in touch with the organizations that are using our data and understanding what their use case is um, and not stealing their secret sauce for why, why the data is valuable to them, but pointing to their use case as demonstrative of the value of the data, right? And I think that what you're outlining is a similar thing. How can I prove out that the app that I'm 
that I've created, that the hack that I've done actually has a broader implication than this 48 hours that I've spent in a room with, you know, potentially a bunch of strangers or some of my best friends. And I, it, one of the things that I would love to do, and I'm not sure that when I'm going to get to this is sort of the marketplace of things that have been developed, right? How could I show on healthdata.gov, for example, that this Administration for Children and Families data set is out there and it was used by these two organizations for this outcome? So that on a national platform, people can see not only the data's availability and the formats that it's available in and the documentation, et cetera, but here's an application of it over here. And for anybody who might be looking for something along those lines, they now have a resource to come to to say, oh, I didn't realize somebody had developed this. Let me reach out to that organization. And it sounds like what you're pointing to is a similar need where we're doing a whole bunch of hacks nationwide and many of them are focused on administration for children and families or you know, social services data. Many of them have likely solved some of the same problems more than once. I, so it's a, really, it's a really cool concept, is how do you network the solutions to be in um, a discoverable, almost marketplace of, here's what we've done, can I team up with you in New York or Atlanta or whatever to build this out further and test you know, the pilot in your, in your local neighborhoods or whatever. I think that's a, fas a fascinating concept and it would be really cool to have somebody stand up a place where Boom, you've stood up. I love it. I think that would be really fantastic, actually. is That would be great. Somebody else over there? Hi, uh, my name is Lawrence Gradeska. I'm with a group called Civic Makers. We're also in the civic hacking community down in the Bay Area. And uh, I just wanted to share that we see the same uh, pain point for the whole civic technology, civic innovation space. And we've been prototyping a, uh, a platform for sharing projects, um, civic hacks, um, data sets, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd love to, anyone wants to talk about that particular issue and how to create opportunities to improve information sharing and, and uh, knowledge sharing, we're all about it. So we'd love to talk. That's really awesome. I was going to make a comment. Steve Posnack from ONC, they recently put up something called the Proving Ground. Mm -hmm. Maybe familiar with that. I didn't yeah. know if you wanted to say a little bit about it because it sounds like there could be application to this community as much as what they're doing on that yeah, side. Yeah, I'm going to have to ask you to say something. I'm yeah. familiar with it, yeah. but I don't know details and I wouldn't want to speak out. Yeah, so it just it. was la actually just last week it, 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 it came out. We were uh, looking at ways to connect the interoperability projects that are going around the country, looking at how do you map those things so that people are not recreating the wheel all the time and that there could be a general map, especially with all of the new investments that are coming out now out of CMS and CMMI and ACF and there's just a, and all of the work that's gone on mm -hmm. well, for the last couple of years, CMS. There's a lot of stuff going on, but it's really hard to know what's happening. So the Office of the National Coordinator, Steve Posnick, put up a very lightweight site called the Proving Ground, which allows people to go onto it, put in their effort. It's very HIE oriented at the moment in time, but it looks like it could be easily sort of, uh, sort of transferred over. So it's a, I think it's a user-driven uh, site where you can put up you know, some criteria that they put up to fit with some of the federal by-weight compliance things and mm -hmm. some other things like that. But it might be a place to go look because it might be already there. You could take an instance of it and just start to use that as a way to do it without having to create a whole other thing there. So that was one of the things But that's interesting. So there's a theme here of the cataloging of efforts, yeah. not just resources, but, you know, cataloging, cataloging and marketing and sort of uh, notating what kinds of things have already transpired. It's a fascinating thing. I think they experienced that across California itself. It's so large that there's a lot of events, a lot of oh, things yeah. are happening here in the state that many people are not even aware of because there's not necessarily a place yet to, to share all that information. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? All right. Oh, one more. Thanks. Just a quick uh, question. You said uh, at one point that it was the, not the government's role to develop the user interface, in a sense, get the data out there and then let others develop the government interface. And I wonder if you could say anything more about that. On one hand, that seems to me like exactly the government's role is to figure out how to make good user interfaces for important information, mm -hmm. and then the flip side of leveraging innovation sure. and others to do so. But it seems like it's the extension of what used to be a traditional role in a different technologic era, but mm -hmm. I'm just, just curious. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, it's an interesting conundrum, right? 
you could have government who is the curator of the data, uh, knows it very well, and can put it out in a myriad of different modern formats. Um, do you necessarily want me to do the job that Yelp could do for me, right? Or some of the other private industry companies that are working diligently toward understanding the customer and their needs from a, a data and service perspective. We could get into a position of, of potentially trying to almost be developing and marketing and getting away from some of the things that would be directly related to the collection of the data. You may end up setting up a long lineage of additional services that basically takes away from something that the private sector is already doing way better than we are, right? Um, so I, I think there's a little bit of a balance there of not necessarily standing up a software development shop to create you know, the amazing uh, sort of private sector style thing. However, I think it is important for us to get away from some of our clunkier websites that are not modern, that don't have you know, API accessibility or even some of the other types of machine re readability. So that's where I feel like the line is, is not necessarily, we're phenomenal at the data collection and we've been doing it for you know hundreds of years. I saw something where census has been collecting since 1792 or something like that. Um, but so we're really good at the data collection piece. The question then becomes, you have a, an interesting use case for the data and these folks over here have an interesting use case for the data. How do I go out and examine literally the entire nation and figure out what the different use cases are so that I can satisfy a customer base that's quite literally the United States population? Or should I allow some corporate entities or private sectors or startups or entrepreneurs and innovators to say, I have a, I have a situation that I'm trying to solve. I have a need that I've identified in a specific customer base. I know where to get the data and I've got the coders and the hackathon folks and the people who are, are doing civic hacking. Let me convene them to satisfy this specific use case you see what I mean? So you seem to disagree. What's your thought? Not completely, no. I think that's, that's spot on, but it's, it's more um, uh, some of the use cases are broad, and the government, that's part of what we're supposed to do is deliver a service that is needed for the population. Yep. And, it, you know, it's just a balance. I mean, you, you use the example of Yelp. If, you know, that's to... Uh, restaurants, you know, to, to, to people to get, go buy food, enjoy the restaurant, but say the equivalent that Yelp is now <coughs> using of uh, uh, environmental inspections of those restaurants. Mm -hmm. So there it's a wonderful innovation that they're using open data to do that. Um, but is there a role for a national, you know, uh, a federated app that anyone could use that is looking at restaurant inspections wherever it is that mm -hmm. doesn't have the commercial link. I, I'm not saying there is. I'm just saying it feels like that government still has a role in delivering information in an innovative way. We don't collect it just to collect it. Absolutely. We did, yeah. we did it to act on it and get it to different partners in different ways. Mm -hmm. We used to produce books like this of census data as well as well curated products yeah. um, or information that was useful for action. So it's yeah, I think what we reached though is a point where um, those tool sets that were developed originally have evolved because we're in an online era now where literally, I mean quite literally every single person in this room could go to the same data set, see it for a completely different reason and have a different app that they would create based on that data and the combination of some other data too in, in a mashup. So that's kind of the tension that I'm talking about is um, let, let government data curators collect, um, manage, make open, and you know, easily accessible through machine readable formats, and then let all of you guys take whatever ideas that you have and move that data into the next phase. So there, there, I think there's a sort of, you can cross the finish line in terms of collecting, curating it, and making it open, and then thereafter, I think it's probably an opportunity for someone else to do something really interesting with it. Hi, uh, Phil Lee from Johns Hopkins. Uh, two other groups that I think just because I've just been in meetings with them or they've actually convened hackathon funds for, for getting information, not necessarily. So I was at Ashoka two weeks ago and almost every one of their programs and things were involved in 
going cross-sector data kind of mm -hmm. things. Uh, so again, just places that, that are developing information and, and networks, uh, many of them are not necessarily networked into formal government organizations. Uh, and the second is, in, in Baltimore, we've had a number of hackathons, because we have a lot of universities there, and even mm -hmm. our high school students have gotten involved. <coughs> yeah. So finding out what some of the universities are doing, and, and, and maybe even just helping to recognize some of the work they're doing, because again, uh, many of your... The grantees of HHS are not necessarily in the same network mm -hmm. as, as, as this this part of things. Even though the federal government's you know funding a lot of these things, it's just sort of pointing out two opportunities that are actually going on all over the country because mm -hmm. uh, we all have universities in our places, and the university students are real, and even the high school students are, are really very excited about it. This is an opportunity, mm -hmm. and so even just making them more aware of some of the things that, that the HHS has formal discussions because again, mm -hmm. I think that that uh, they're, they're not necessarily totally siloed, but I think that there's not a lot of good communication across the two yet HHS and the federal government obviously has lots of good communication with, mm -hmm. with both the, 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 N, the uh, NGO kind of Ashoka types and certainly mm -hmm. with the universities mm -hmm. uh, for facilitating some of that information exchange. So I think what I heard was better communication about the various things that we're working on so that you can understand where to engage. Is that or, roughly the things that are being engaged on, and as well as as there are some better, you know, again more sophisticated apps or better apps, I think the the increase in their use mm -hmm. uh, by the young people that are actually then working with community groups, mm -hmm. both nonprofits, and government agencies, so facilitating better information that these things exist, because mm -hmm. uh, right now they're you know, and some of them are enormously sophisticated. Yeah, uh, some of them have multi-million dollar contracts. Right. Uh, as a result, they're they're and you know, they're already you know dropping out of school <laughs> to become business people. Yeah. But I think the information exchange as HHS and some of the other groups really are, you know are are summarizing or are. are Placing, you know, information, knowledge about some of these more sophisticated or more widely used apps or techniques, mm -hmm. then I think there's a lot of widespread dissemination using some of the younger people to help disseminate. Mm -hmm. And that's the goal. Is you know, there's so many people across various networks that are spreading the word. I mean, to the extent that we can get the messages out as in as many places as possible, you know, there's nothing but benefit that can come from that. It's really exciting to see. The challenge, I think, is like, how do I do my day job and, you know, <laughs> engage with the public on a regular basis and create the, uh, you know, the graphic user interface that's going to allow for, you know, or the the service that's going to allow for um, really good customer engagement across a wide spectrum. It's just a lot of stuff to do, and I think that's why we're all in this room is because we all need to help each other to do these things together. One more. Hi, Damon. Hi. I'm so glad that you're here. I wonder if I could get you to talk briefly. One of the most exciting and I think dynamic pieces out of things to come out of the Idea Lab is how it spurred entrepreneurship mm -hmm. throughout HHS. Mm -hmm. And taking that federal example and those success stories, how might that be replicated within states, mm -hmm. within county agencies, and how, uh, just a couple of examples yeah. out of that. I think one of the things that was really powerful about this, the, uh, the rise of the Idea Lab was that folks didn't actually realize that you, you had a, they didn't have a safe place to go to say, you know, I've got a really cool idea, I just don't know how to do it. Right? I don't know what agile development is, and I don't know what lean processes are, and I don't know how to sort of get my manager to let me slice off a little bit of time here so that I can try to focus on what I think could be really beneficial for my entire office, or maybe potentially my agency, let alone the department. So <clears throat> we've often said that having a safe space to experiment is one of the really powerful things about the Idea Lab. I think the other thing is, um, as I said, having the actual leadership be engaged with it, supportive of it, prioritizing it, right? Um, dedicating resources to it. I talked a little bit about some of the prize money. I talked a little bit about some of the awards to ventures, things like that. There are actual dollars associated with attempting to change a service or change a, an issue or change a, a process in the department. Um, and I think it's important too that we take the lessons learned and make sure that they too are widely disseminated because we don't want to get into a position of what we talked about earlier. You're experimenting over here and you don't know that that experimentation has happened and you're recreating something in a completely different way. 
Um, so the air cover, as we like to call it, the managerial support, um, the actual commitment to trying to innovate, uh, giving people a, a safe place to experiment on things is incredibly valuable. Um, but also giving them the tool set. I've mentioned the dollars, but one of the things that some of my colleagues will tell you is <clears throat> it's not necessarily about the dollars. A lot of times it's the process thinking. How do I go back from this training that we've just had, the Ignite Boot Camp that I mentioned, or other stuff, and change my thinking about how I now engage with this project, but how do I also retain that changed thinking toward the next set of things? And how do I turn to one of my other colleagues and say, man, I just did this Ignite thing, you should totally go do that, because you and I have talked about this project, and I think that you would benefit from that. And having those kinds of things proliferate throughout the fabric of the organization is incredibly important. So the, the uh, Human Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, has set up their own idea spring, which is basically along the lines, if I, if I may, of the Idea Lab. And that, that goes back to my going out of business sign, right? If we can get Idea Labs in a variety of different places such that the innovative and creative thinking has spread throughout the organization, um, you've really kind of done an amazing thing. And I think any government, state, local, whatever, is capable of taking a step back and saying, we've got a lot of processes here that we're kind of not doing very well. Let's start to think about what the rules actually say and then what's possible and work within the confines of those and you'll, you'll find all kinds of new and interesting approaches to things. So thank you guys very much for your time to this morning.